Welcome to another episode of, of my interview series. Today, I'm talking to Jeff Tucker of the Brownstone Institute. Jeff has been a key figure in the liberty movement for decades. He worked for Ron Paul. He was president of the Mises Institute. You've probably heard of his great Barrington Declaration during COVID, where Jeff assembled top scientists who made the case against totalitarian lockdowns. Today, I want to ask Jeff about a recent article he wrote on the Weimar hyperinflation and what is coming next. Jeff, thanks for coming on. Sure, it's nice to be here. I enjoyed writing that article because it gave me a chance to to read books I hadn't actually read before, things, you know, important books from the period. Yeah, it's amazing how many books there are on economic history, and some of these are real gems. You had a couple of them that you cited during the article that were actually from the period of the 1930s, right? Right. One is by, I'll never get this name right, Constantino Brescianni Torini or something like this, okay? <laughs> All right. I probably I probably botched that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, can't really be in touch about that. Yeah, yeah, something like that. But anyway, um, I I even practiced saying it before this interview, and I and I already messed it up, you know. Uh, but uh, but it was a book that came out, um, I, th I think in the in the in the mid nineteen thirties, by an by an Italian political economist who was had followed the case really carefully. So it's it's really detailed. I think it's, of all the books I've seen, this is really the, the best one. I read that. It was kind of exciting. You know, to get, get get steeped into this world, he had the introduction by of all people Lionel Robbins, who I think is the, the the top, you know, just the leading economist of of you know the Commonwealth countries in the interwar period. I think a guy is an epic, epic genius. Really, I love all of his works. He li yeah. he, he lived for yeah, seemingly forever, but he was just a great guy. He's the guy who brought Hayek over to the LSD. Uh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. A serious guy, big business cycle theorist, marginal utility theorist, but also just a genius in history, history of thought and just a, just a really salient voice in all matters. I, I've come to trust Lionel Robbins. Anyway, Robbins writes the introduction to this book by our nice Italian friend. And, um, and, and, and so he writes that it was the most significant um, event of its kind in, in the, the history of, of, world. I think he said something like this. And of course, wow. he's, right, he's writing before, you know, World War II. It's important to remember World this World generation World. didn't know what was coming after the Weimar inflation, you know, uh, destroyed the government in 1923. And then and then we saw, and, and actually, Lionel Robbins says this, he says that uh, Hitler was the stepchild or somebody like that of this inflation. Stepchild of the hyperinflation. Yeah, right. and uh, that's correct. I mean, it destabilized society to such an extent uh, where people no longer believed in anything. There was no longer a monarchy. We can talk about this. Um, yeah. There was nothing left for Germany after 1920. Like nothing. The money had failed. Society had failed. Everything. The rich had gotten you know, extremely wealthy from the inflation, if you can believe it. And everybody else was just robbed and pillaged. Uh, so they had to recreate everything. And th there was a, a really strong desire to, to scapegoat. And, and Hitler stepped into that, into that breach. And then you know, then, then everything that unfolded, unfolded, next thing you know, not next thing you know, but, you know, some years later, Europe, the map of Europe was uh, turned black and, um, and doom was the ultimate doom was, was upon us. Um, and it, for, none of that would have happened without this Weimar inflation. Without the inflation. So for people who are not familiar with the episode, sort of walk us through. So you have World War One. That ends with the Treaty of Versailles, and then what happens next? Well, you know, if you wouldn't mind, Peter, I'd like to, 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 to yeah. go back to the Great War because uh, because this is the the thing, right? So, yeah. uh, and even before the Great War, uh, governments of the world discovered this thing called central banking. That happened in Germany first, then the UK, and then the US adopted one in 1913. So by the time uh, these this diplomatic uh, screw ups that led to this uh, to the uh, breakout of the Great War happened. Governments were infused with the 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 burning desire to use their new scientific tools uh, of money printing to to fund the war. Now this happens at the same time you had a, a big technological increase in armaments. Uh, mm -hmm. you, know, you had the invention. You know, flight was now coming online, so it was available to governments. Uh, we had uh, the invention of poison uh, gas. 
Um, and, and everybody was excited. Like, we, humanity has cool new tools. What should we do with them? Let's kill each other. <laughs> so, 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 uh, so, uh, so, uh, so the central banks, uh, funded the war effort, uh, entirely. And this is true all over Europe. Uh, it's true in the United States. The U.S. inflated less than, less than others. But although, if you look at CPI, the dollar lost, you know, half its purchasing power after, after the war ended. Uh, it was, it was a calamity for the U.S., but, but a special calamity for, for Europe. So they, in the past, these kind of wars would, threatened to break out all the time, but nobody can afford them. Now, mm -hmm. central banks suddenly, you know, every major government in the world had a printing press, you know, adjacent to the presidential palace. You know, that's a hard thing to resist. So uh, the government's going to work. Uh, the war ends with the great dawn of democracy, right? It's a big slogan of the time. So, so, and there was this widespread belief in the world that if we just get rid of the monarchs, and have democracy, then everything's going to be amazing. So, so the victorious war war allies uh, in, in the Great War forced the abdication of Frederick Wilhelm II, uh, the the bad the bad guy Kaiser. You know who? The, it was a time when the U.S. Were, I, you know anything German. You know, like you couldn't drink beer or something. I mean, you know, just one of those sort of hysterias that the Kaiser. Yeah, our world. crow. Yeah, yeah. our crow. Became Liberty Cabbage, right? That was <laughs> kind of kind of predated freedom fries by a couple decades. Yeah, Americans are insane. Um, so yeah, so we finally got rid of the Kaiser. We forced his abdication. That's a three hundred year old monarchy of a, from a great a great civilization. You know, three hundred year old uh, monarch is suddenly, you know, out of a job along with the royal family, along with all the aristocracy. Everything was overthrown. And then the, the U.S. and the Allies decided to pursue a medieval-style strategy post-war, which was to the victors go the, the, the spoils, right? So they decided to, to get their war loot um, in the name of, of reparations. And uh, Britain and the U.S. was uh, exacted extreme peace terms as part of the Versailles Treaty. Also part of the Versailles Treaty is this idiot Woodrow Wilson you know, randomly created states everywhere. You know, if you if you could get a telegram to the White House that said, we're Slovakia, then he might consider you, <laughs> that kind of thing. I mean, it was just, you know, just an appalling, uh, an appalling thing. A guy who should, should should never have been president in the first place. You know, he would have lost in 1912, but for the, the Roosevelt uh, campaign, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, so uh, he was accidentally president and then accidentally central planner of the world after the Great War. And then as part of that, it was like, let's get our let's get as much money from Germany as possible. Well, Germany found itself in a position. It couldn't both rebuild its economy, you know, post monarchy with massive political destabilization and a new experiment and this thing called democracy. They couldn't rebuild itself and pay its debts at, at the same time. The debts had to be paid in hard currency. So, uh, you know, as try as they might, they couldn't do it. So they started experimenting with printing money to buy the hard currency, buy the gold, buy uh, hard German marks that were backed by gold to pay uh, war rep reparations to, to Britain mm -hmm. and to the U.S. And that worked for a while. Um, in right. 1920, the stock market was just going wild and everybody was really happy. It's like, well... Glad the war is over. Uh, these debts are being paid as if by magic. You know, the stimulus package seems to be working very well. <laughs> the stock markets, you know, were roaring up 70%. Everybody had new jobs. It's like, you know, day traders were everywhere. Uh, uh -huh. Everybody's working two or three jobs. There's so much money to be made, which typically happens in the early, early part of an inflation. But then it just it ripped through society so fast after uh, 19, uh, about midway through 21, the inflation started and then it just didn't stop. And, and I wish I had a, a number, but it's, it's in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Uh, my article has some, some data on this to the point you couldn't, you couldn't afford bread, you couldn't afford anything. And then the famous right. case that you know, anything you could carry your money in, uh, whether it was wine bottles or wheelbarrows, uh, was the risk was that those things would be stolen, the money dumped and abandoned. And by the winter of 2023, uh, going into 24, the currency was routinely used as uh, heating fuel for homes.
Yeah, you had that in the article, how you would take your money in the wheelbarrow and people would steal the wheelbarrow and they would just dump the money on the ground. It's pretty astounding. So, you know, of course, this is the flight to real values where concrete yeah. objects have value. Zeroing in on one of those, and you and I have talked about this before as well, but so it's really fascinating that early in the inflation, even the hyperinflation, things look amazing, right? You've got you know, government is pumping out deficit spending. You've got stimmies. You've got the stock market is soaring because the new money goes into asset markets first, asset markets capitalize future. So talk a little bit about that. What happened in Weimar and maybe how that could be happening today? Well, you know, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by this because it is really uh, is just genuinely true that in the early stages of inflation, everybody thinks everything's wonderful. And I, you, know, you just only have to go back to those magical days of 2020. You know, when, um, by the way, consumer confidence had peaked uh, in January of 2020 uh, at a 21st century high. So there's a wow. great deal of, of confidence as we went into uh, 2020. And then uh, then there was, you know, this kind of a frenzy over, over a virus and this cockamamie uh, idea that we should all just stand six feet apart. And, and shut small businesses uh, and close basketball courts and don't go to the beach. Yeah. Then the virus will get really scared and go back into a hole or fly to the planet it was, or something. It was like a religious ritual. We have to do that specific dance or the gods will be angry. And uh, yeah, you know, at, at, at the time, Raji Vankaya, who, who had come up with this cockamamie scheme back in 2005 under the George W. Bush, um, uh, administration. He was the first one who ever, you know, toyed with the idea of, of lockdowns, the event of, of uh, the flu. Uh, called me up and said, "Well, like you're completely wrong to be against lockdowns." And I kept asking him, uh, "What's going to happen to to the to the bug?" I mean, I'm sorry, Rajiv. I respect you, but I don't get it. Like, right? This invisible enemy. If we if we scare it and wear a mask and stand apart from each other and uh, uh, don't uh, hold weddings and funerals. Uh, does the virus get scared or what? And he, uh, after a long, persistent, you know, <laughs> questions along this lines, he finally said, "Oh, don't worry, we'll get a vaccine." At which point, I thought he was a crazy person. You know, I had no idea what was going on. Uh, but in any case, it was weird because um, the strange agency called the Cyber Infrastructure Security. Uh, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security, divided the whole no. workforce between essential and non-essential, and wow. and and that was in 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 March. It was like, okay, here's our PDF. You decide if you're essential or non-essential. It's like, well, who who's going to enforce this? And what happens if I don't comply with it? it was never clear. It was strange. Right. It felt like martial law, but essential yep. was uh, essentially all the elites, you know, like you know, government and media. Uh, people and then and then those who are tasked with serving them, uh, delivery boys to bring groceries, to, you know, to the front door. People to, to deliver, you know, Game Boys and laptops <laughs> to your house. So it was like the high and low of the social structure, and everybody in the middle was cut out. So if you if you were you know if you cut hair or, or do fingernails or or preach, you know, at a, at a, a church service or something like that, you were just unessential like, and like and. Uh, uh, but it was strange because at that same time, suddenly. A word from our lead sponsor, Unchained. An IRA is a retirement account that can save you a lot of taxes if used correctly. With Unchained, you can hold real Bitcoin in your IRA, and it's the only company where you hold the keys and can verify that your Bitcoin is not being re like banks do. We've seen futures-based ETFs underperform holding Bitcoin, so why settle for less? Go to Unchained.com, and until August 15th, Save $1,745 on an IRA using promo code August IRA. That's A U G U S T I R A. Now back to our show. For the first time in our lives, really, first time in American history, uh, the IRS, the U.S. Treasury Department, would d directly deposit money into your bank account. So you, you know, checking your bank balance is like, I'm, I'm, why do I have so much money? This is amazing. I've got thousands of dollars I didn't have before. You know, this, this is odd. Usually I pay taxes and now the government is paying me. So this right. went on, you know, for, for, for months, really months going all the way up to, uh, to the end of the year. And then we had another round of stimulus at the uh, beginning part of the next year. And it was like, 
I'm not working. I'm luxuriating. Um, I'm day drinking. I've, I've, I've caught up on all the Netflix I've been missing for the last you know, 10 years. Uh, people bring me groceries. I, 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 I hang out in, in meetings uh, with, with, on Zoom with my fake colleagues who are also not doing work. I bought a mouse jiggler to, you know, to, to convince <laughs> my boss that I'm going to work here, but mostly I'm at the pool. But I'm richer than ever. I mean, we are, we are just, and, and savings went up, you know, savings you know, peaked to like 30%. Yeah, oh. you can buy it except from Amazon, you know, but you try to go down to your local butcher and he's shot because of the virus. So Amazon got really wealthy, and it turns out, um, you know, Bezos's paper was advocating for for uh, the lockdown. But anyway, the prosperity was implausible. I mean, it was right. strange. It was, you know, the greatest head fake in modern history because within eighteen months of the start of the lockdowns, the inflation came along, and and we were just sitting around. And and by the way, people were shocked by this because you know, in two thousand eight, the Fed did a similar a similar sort of thing. Uh, printed a lot of money, created a lot of a lot of you know monetary base was growing. We all thought inflation was going to break out, but it didn't because the Fed had the scheme that it would suck the money out of the banking system and deposit mm -hmm. it in the Fed, keep it to keep the hot money off the streets. And so it never translated into inflation. It created a bunch of phony assets so banks could suddenly announce to the world, "We're profitable. Stop withdrawing your money. We are making money. Everybody's rich." And uh, it doesn't matter. It was all built on funny baloney debt and and never marked to market still isn't marked to market all that uh mortgage backed securities bought in 2008 but it didn't translate to higher prices so when yeah. the when the magic money printers got to rolling in march of 2020 there was a widespread hope that it it too would magically vanish you know that it would we would just get prosperous and it didn't seem like anything was really happening until about midway uh through 21 it really it was like the first quarter or something when we started seeing prices tick up and then Janet Yellen, don't worry about it. This is just supply chain breakages. You know, the, we've got, we've got this, this, this inflation is transitory. Yeah. Now that was, that's a funny word because it sounds like temporary. Right. But it really just means transitioning from one thing to another. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Wait, right. And, so and, but they kept it. The promise was that it was always ending. And and it was what's funny, Peter, about this is we've been through three years of, of inflation constantly cooling, pulling back, relaxing, going away. You know, every headline with every CPI release for three years has been the same thing. Inflation's cooling, it's going away, but of course you look back and it's it's been it's been catastrophic. And and people I, I think people are just now becoming aware of it. I've called it the greatest economic head fake in, in modern times because the prosperity was quickly wiped away. And I, I, I think you would have to do some figures on it, but like even according to the official CPI, the stimulus was gone and and certainly in 24 months after it was released. So like gone in the sense of inflated away uh, by, by purchasing power loss. Yeah, well, it's a fascinating episode um, because it does hearken so much to what happened in World War One. So as you know, a lot of the architects of that war on both sides, uh, they were reaching for what they called wartime socialism. And they were hoping for a war because that would finally enable them to install that socialism. And for example, during World War I, like all major wars, they very clearly divided the workforce into essential and non-essential. Right. So, you know, if you're making, you know, whatever, uh, <laughs> garden decorations you're not going to get the steel you're not going to get the iron for that you have to apply to it and then the ministry of production is going to say no we need that for weapons and so covid was was fascinating because i think really for the first time they played the wartime socialism script but this time i mean they didn't have a war handy despite their best efforts and so they reached for this stupid respiratory illness and spun that thing up into wartime socialism so it it, it sort of echoes the events of war one and so the question is at this point what's coming next right um it does and i i hadn't really thought about comparing the domestic policies although you know you had the censorship that was first first time in 20th century it was a 
uh, censorship all throughout World War One. I mean, they were jail opponents of the war, so that was very active. And of course, it became very active starting in, in the, right after the lockdowns in 2020. The censorship began here and has not stopped, and it's it's ongoing as we as we've seen the last several days uh, over over uh, Google's manipulation of tr Trump algorithms concerning Trump and so on. And, mm -hmm. and, and they're right. taking down things you know, just all the time. Um, but I have uh, been able to compare the the spending uh and, and and growth of government over 2020 21 22 um and 23 uh, with with uh world war ii so um and i've posted this thing it's a really fascinating chart that compares uh federal debt against gdp and it's it's really interesting because it looks like a giant u-shape and you saw, you know, the U on the right side start to go up at 2000, 2008 and, and following and so on. But then it goes parabolic, you know, in 2020 and now is actually higher than it was in 1946. As a percent of GDP. As a percent of, yeah, yeah. Percent of GDP. And you can just look at this, this U shape and it's actually quite shocking. And, you know, in line of that, uh, and we've talked about this, um, people say that, you know, we had a very slight recession in 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 March and April of of twenty twenty, and then then it ended. And ever since then, we've been on a on a kind of a mild growth path. So I think there's a reason not to believe any of that data because, you know, a GDP also expanded dramatically in, in World War II, and it took about twenty years before economists looked back at that data and said, "Yeah, well, hold on, just a minute here." You know, is this really prosperity when you're when when everything you buy is 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 rationed when you can't buy a, you know a, a, a roll of foil without a coupon with the lard was banned you know where people were being trapped and slaughtered abroad when everything was rationed during wartime music mean, that is not what you would normally call uh, prosperity. So the output increases during World War II were entirely a statistical illusion. And now it's a profession-wide consensus, economists are kind of slow, uh, that the real recovery out of the New Deal began in 1948 at, at war's end. Okay. Well, that, what are we going to say then about our own wartime economy that began in 2020, where you actually maxed out federal debt as a percentage of GDP uh, in, in comparable terms to World War II itself? You know, are we going to find out in 20 years that this is all illusory also? I mean, this is one of the reasons I, I hope to get this work done now so that we can recognize, you know, the, 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 the very real possibility that the recession of March 2020 uh, never came to an end and everything else is just an illusion. A word for our sponsor. If you're looking for a podcast that cuts through the noise and delivers honest, truthful, and conservative perspectives, check out the Daily Signal podcast. Each weekday, they bring you interviews with policymakers on the issues that matter most. From breaking down complex legislation to exposing media bias, they're committed to giving you the facts you won't hear from the establishment media. Subscribe now to the Daily Signal podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Now back to the show. Yeah, that point about the recovery starting 1948, that's absolutely critical because that is an, a, a linchpin of the left's uh, sort of capsule version of 20th century history, right? Is that, you know, the free market caused the Great Depression and then FDR heroically came in and saved it. And key being that he saved it with war. There's actually a lot of conservatives yeah. even today who think that war boosts the economy. So, of course, they're thinking in terms of GDP yeah. or in government numbers. They're not thinking in terms of the wealth that destroys well, that's right. And and really, anybody who says that is, is quite behind the times in terms of uh, the literature. It's just a silly claim. Uh, what I've heard most recently is that the recovery began after World War II, but only thanks to the GI Bill, which I would dispute also. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the important reason, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, diverted, yeah. diverted workers to become intellectuals that for which there is no market demand. I'm not sure how that causes uh, everything to recover. Schumpeter had great comments on this, by the way. Highly recommend that book. Uh, um, right. But uh, uh, the the critical thing about national output statistics is that they uh, began to national income out, output statistics is is that they were forged in the 1930s. 
at the height of kind of Keynesian theory, where the idea is that you can determine prosperity by aggregate supply and aggregate demand. And you can, if you increase aggregate demand enough, then you get prosperity. And that demand can come from consumers, but it can also come from government. So long as there's somebody out there calling forth resources and, you know, and, 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 and more and more money is changing hands, then that's prosperity. So that's, that's how the GDP uh, came to be calculated. There's nothing accurate about it. I mean, we really should uh, subtract government from GDP. Um, and, and then you would have a much, in fact, Murray Rothbard, I think, was the very first person who suggested this in his uh, great book, mm-hmm. uh, Man, Economy, and State. He wanted to come up with a new uh, uh, statistic called private product remaining, which I think is a very interesting, but nobody keeps, keeps track of that. So let's say you subtract government out of GDP over the last four years. Yeah, I would just like to see what the results would be. I think we would already be in negative territory. And certainly, once you start uh, adjusting GDP in real terms, uh, then we're, we're going to be genuinely, in, in, by, by an accurate uh, rendering of, of inflation, I mean, even by CPI, but this thing that they use, this uh, uh, p- personal c- uh, consumption... Expenditure, or, expenditure yeah. personal consumption expenditure is, runs, you know, 30% less than CPI. So it's even less plausible than CPI. That's the figure by which they adjust the GDP. I will say this, however, at least we habitually adjust the GDP by inflation. We ask for it in real terms instead of nominal terms. We don't right. do that for retail sales and wholesale factory orders. And our colleague, E.J. Anthony, is the first guy I've ever seen who's actually done, done that. All he does is takes wholesale factory orders and retail sales and adjusts them by the CPI. It goes, what are the what are the results? I mean, not an increase, but flat to decreasing over four years. Yeah, you know? I mean that is remarkable. And, and just to put it in simple terms, like if if I got a haircut last month and it was twenty dollars, and I go back to get a haircut this month and it was twenty five dollars, you kind of have an economist observe that and go, "Yeah, it's very nice. We have a twenty percent increase in in retail sales going on." No, you just spent more money on the same stupid good. That is not an increase yeah. in retail sales. But that's how the numbers are reported. They're always reported in nominal terms. So at least the GDP is, tends to be reported in real terms, but not using a realistic uh, uh, framework for understanding how much the dollar has declined. Yeah, and that's something that you and I have talked a lot about lately is you know trying to figure out what the heck is inflation these days, right? So right. since the pandemic, I think by all accounts, uh, even mainstream economists accept that there's a lot of problems with the inflation numbers now, uh, because for example, they're habitually seasonally adjusted, which means they go in and try to correlate based on what happened. Uh, you know, in winter time, people have more cash because of Christmas time and whatever. You have all these uh, seasonal adjustments they make. And during the pandemic, a lot of those broke. Uh, the correlations were just so far off, they didn't know how to adjust. And at this point, they're sort of flying blind. That's even mainstreamers saying that. But you and I have talked about the fact that, you know, real world stuff, like everything you can actually verify, it's up a heck of a lot more than the official inflation rate of, what is it, 24%? Uh, yeah, well, I think uh, it, it's it's over four years. I think it's closer to 20%, 24 Yeah, wow, um, yeah. But... Uh, but groceries, you can look at industry sources and see groceries are up, you know, 34%. And and look at things like olive oil, I and mean, I think it's up like 300%, you know, so it, wow. it depends on the product. Um, and then car prices, you know, are up 60%. Nobody thinks they're up just 20%. It's ridiculous. And home prices, uh, we have Federal Reserve data that show home prices. I, I forget now what it is, but it's, it's just crazy, you know, just a crazy yeah. amount. The home price index, which the Fed keeps and reports, is very, very high. It's, you know, 50, 60, 70%, which even that is underestimated. Like, look at homes in your own neighborhood uh, and Zillow right. and look at price four years ago compared to now. You're going to find price increases, depending on where you are, 100%, 170% and, and higher. Um, but incredibly, the Fed has that data, but they don't use that. The BLS does not use that in calculating inflation. Instead, they look at homeowners' equivalent rent. Uh, yeah. Which is a way of kind of game. It's, you know, the fancier these these data collections techniques get, the more uh, ripe they are for manipulation. And the rationale is, well, you're not going out and buying a home, you know, every month or every year, so it doesn't really matter if homes are higher or low. Well, okay, 
Um, but And so that's why they come up with homeowners equivalent rent. But you do maybe shop for homes. And even if you're not buying it, maybe the reason you're not buying it is because it's so expensive. So, I mean, you're much better off just looking at straight up numbers. So they do the same stupid thing with, with um, health care insurance, which which it's right now health insurance is still on, I think, a, a, maybe a slightly up since 2020. But it was on a downward, like a deep downward dive um, from 22 to 23. And the reason is that the the pricing of health insurance, according to the BLS, is calculated uh, not just what you pay in insurance, that that would be what a normal person would do. uh, But the BLS goes, well, you really need to adjust it according to how much you consume. So if you consume (laughs) more health care products, that should be countered against the increase because, you know, well, you're going to pay the price regardless if you consume or not. So I, I just like right. to know the price, but no. And so during 2020, this is where it gets crazy during 2020 and the early part of 2021, spending on health care because it was a, a deadly pandemic went down by about 30 percent. OK, well, so, yeah, because, because all the hospitals were closed and doctors were going to the office and people were scared. So they didn't spend any money. So then once uh, the opening uh, things started opening up, people were sick because they lacked exposure. They were fat and drunk and, you know, addicted and and starved of vitamin D. So they're pouring into the hospitals, massively consuming healthcare uh, resources uh, over the course of 2022 20, and 23. And the BLS looks at this and goes, hmm, I think we're seeing deflation take place. Okay, so there's that well, kind of stuff goes on. But yeah. once we adjust it, it actually went down, folks. Yeah. Stuff in that was in, yeah. So and then you have the problem the exclusion of, of interest too, right? So if you if you pay if you were you've got a resolving credit card, you're paying twenty two to twenty uh three percent uh today or even higher, whereas five years ago you were paying, I don't know what they were, you know, maybe five to seven percent. And we've seen mortgages go up and five years, ten years get interest rates are dramatically up. And uh, and it, and actually reporting real uh, re- interest rates are in a positive uh, territory in short term uh, for the first time in like 20, 20 years. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, interest uh, payments on interest uh, on loans is not even considered part of the CPI. There's a paper that came out from MBER that just rolled those in and came up with an 18 percent inflation rate of uh, for 2023. Wow. Um, wow. So, you know, the. The, you just make these adjustments and, and things get crazy. Uh, there's a lot of things that are excluded. Uh, home home insurance is not included uh, because they don't include home prices themselves. Property taxes. Oh, no. Yeah, those are out. The other thing that's interesting about these indexes, is the way an index works is you, you look at a, 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 a banana last year and a banana this year um, and compare the price and you come up with you know, a basket of goods and you compare the two and that's your index. Okay. But what if you have new goods coming online or new products that you're purchasing that have no precedent? Okay. You can't come up with an index for that. Well, you notice all the fees, airline fees, restaurant fees, you're paying a fee for everything, uh, everywhere. You're paying a climate change fee. I mean, you're paying fees for everything these days. Those are not ever included in the index. They necessarily won't be because they didn't previously exist. So you can't calculate inflation rate against a brand new product. In this case, it's a service fee or a customer fee or a convenience fee or a climate change fee, all these fees. The other thing that's typically not included is, of course, shrinkflation. Uh, right. And, and the BLS claims to track it, but you know, I've read all the literature on this. There's just no way they can, they can possibly do it. Uh, there's no chance. So inflation... Tries to hide itself in various ways, and the BLS has got no interest whatsoever in in seeking it out. So I don't know what the numbers would look like um, if you made all those adjustments that we just talked about. It's a fascinating question, of course, because that's been one of the big mysteries this past year. Is the mainstream economists say everybody's doing amazing, and then the actual Americans, you know, most Americans now say we're in a recession. They say they're struggling. You've yeah. got a whole lot of metrics. You know, they view McDonald's as a luxury item. So the data on the ground says that we're in something like a recession, even as the official data looks like we're just growing like gangbusters. And these data uh, gremlins hiding inside of there are probably a huge part of that. 
Well, and if you look at the consumer confidence, I mentioned earlier that it had peaked for the 21st century in, in January of 2020. Now it's down uh, near 2008 uh, lows. Wow. So it's much closer to reality. You know, you, people are trusting their eyes, not their, uh, not not the baloney they're reading in, of all things, the New York Times. The New York Times had an article saying, oh, wherever the next president's going to be, it's going to be inheriting the strongest economy. You can't believe it. What are you guys talking? Have you looked at the Fed's balance sheet recently? I mean, come on. They're holding $6 trillion of junk. Um, uh, anyway, um, one thing that's really interesting about this, Peter, is that one of the things that, that stops the CPI from being the higher than it is, uh, in addition to all the stuff we talked about, is the price of imported goods. If you look at the import import uh, index over four years, is is practically flat. Um, and this would affect things like textiles, you know, like you can go right now to Amazon and discover that there's been almost no inflation in, for example, sheets or towels, uh, uh -huh. things that are, are made abroad or electronic goods are up only 3%. I believe these numbers. The reason for that is that at the same time, the dollar has lost 20, 30, 40, 50% of its value um, domestically internationally, it has remained very, very strong. So what does that do? That makes imports uh, very uh, cheap relative to things uh, made in the United States. So this right. is why when you when you want to want to buy electronic goods or sheets and towels or other other goods made abroad on Amazon, it seems like the last four years didn't happen at all. But if you want to buy, you know, hamburger meat or a house or a car, or you want to pay for for insurance, or anything that's like homegrown or tied to the physical world that is assembled um, using dollar-based uh, uh, supply chains, that is where you're going to find your highest level of inflation. So it's extremely intriguing. Uh, you had this gigantic inflation that took place f f from, from the, the money print to the Federal Reserve, which created vast amounts of debt that were bought uh, by central banks all over the world to serve as assets on top of which they inflated, built up their production structures to make cheap goods to sell to Americans. We're looking at uh, what do we want to buy? Well, we want to buy the cheap stuff, so we buy all the cheap stuff abroad, and all the domestic uh, manufacturers are facing this intense uh, uh, supply, you know, cost uh, pressure from labor, and from resources and commodity prices, everything they want to do, rents, you name it, is going sky high. And they're competing against, you know, historically very low uh, foreign suppliers. And so what do you know? There's a gigantic political movement in this country for tariffs. That should right. not surprise us at all. It's just that one follows the other. Again, all of this stuff is spillover from the fundamental currency problem, uh, which I would yeah. like to see solved. I don't have the solution apart from celebrating a gold standard to somebody like that, but um, we've got to solve this problem. And and, and the reason we, this whole conversation started with Weimar, so Weimar did not solve its money problem, and it destroyed society. And I, I'm afraid we're headed the same way. So how did Weimar finally fix it? Like, how did the hyperinflation end? Well, they came up with, they, they got a new currency and developed a heavily protectionist uh, economy and then a producer, uh, producer policy uh, that Hitler uh, imposed that uh, cartelized all industry and created uh, basically a, um, a vampiric um, style economy that, that pillaged all the uh, further, all the small businesses and created giant corporations that inflated their way through the war until it, you know, everything collapsed again. Uh, the 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 final fix for the Weimar inflation was came after uh, the end of World War II, uh, where we saw genuine economic reforms and then this rallying around uh, sound money that lasted for the better part of the remaining part of the century, where Germany was, you know, determined never to inflate again. Um, so that's a solution. But you know, also the fix came with the gold standard. So. After World right. War II, uh, all currencies in the world were uh, tied to gold, uh, not domestically, but internationally, uh, through a system called uh, Britain Woods. So what we 
you know, the, the floating exchange rates and fiat currency that we have now did not exist for the, from the end of World War II all the way to 1971. It, everything was on a gold standard, which is a great basis for prosperity. And it meant that trade flows happened according to the old, you know, 18th and 19th century style. You know, gold would go this way and then gold would go that way. Imports and exports tended to even out over time. Nations did not run systematic trade deficits the way they do now. And there was no such thing as a trillion dollars in, in currency markets, people day trading. And currency, that just didn't exist. All currencies in the world were different names for basically the same thing. That's what would happen probably in a, in a free market. That broke down in 1971 for various structural reasons. Um, you can't have uh, the whole world on, on a, on a dollar-based gold uh, uh, system with different fiscal policies in every government because you're going to see draining of gold. When the U.S. started losing gold, Nixon panicked and, and created this, this system we're living under now. But it's been extremely costly uh, to the U.S. in terms of the industrial base, uh, just coordinating exchange over time. And, and, and most times it's not that bad. But when you have uh, inflation like we saw over the course of two years from 2020 to 2021, where uh, the Fed printed, you know, what, I guess we were about $6 trillion. At some point it peaked at 26% per annum. I think that was in April or May of 2020 and then have this kind of roaring inflation result of the helicopter strategy of its distribution. You have that taking place at the same time that U.S. debt is being marketed all over, the, exported all over the world and then inflated upon after that. Now you're getting tremendous trade distortions. And, and I'm telling you, you know, I understand the impulse to want to solve this problem through tariffs. I get it. But it's not a solution. It's probably going to make everything even worse. Right. So bottom line, if we do go Weimar, the solution is either predatory vampiric oligopoly <laughs> or the gold standard. <laughs> there, <you go. laughs> there we go. If, if yeah. it teaches us anything. <laughs> All right, Jeff, uh, I, I want to ask you a final question. So as a doyen of the Liberty Movement, what do you think the Liberty Movement is doing today that's smart? And what do you think we should all be doing a lot more of? Well, I was very disappointed during during the lockdown period that we didn't have more voices, you know, out yeah. there uh, raging against, you know, our worst possible totalitarian nightmare. You know, we could have really benefited from that. But those yeah. those days are done. What I'd like to see um, people in the libertarian space do more of is uh, empirical research, actually, mm -hmm. like really looking into end of industries, how they work, how government regulations affect them. Uh, the way the administrative state has, has so injured um, the prospects for free enterprise and also examining much more carefully this this thing that RFK talks about all the time, which is this combination of big business and big government yep. into this, as, as you said, oligarchic, uh, ol ol oligarchic, you know, uh, sort of arrangements. And, and this is not free enterprise. And I would like to see uh, people with a liberty mindset examine this much more carefully. Along the lines that the great John T. Flynn did, actually. He was a great writer. I've been reading a lot of him from the interwar period. He really took apart the New Deal and and uh, wrote a great uh, account of what happened. I think we need something very similar for our own times. Fantastic. Uh, okay, uh, Jeff, where can people follow you? Uh, if you want to mention some of the projects that you're working on these yeah. days. Well, you know, we've got... You and EJ engaged on this really important uh, work on on revising the economic history of the last four years. I'm so interested to see what comes of that. We've got a pandemic planning research group. You know, the, it's really important for people to understand that, that the lockdowns are not a part of history. They're, 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 they're every sense part of our future if the World Health Organization has its way. Uh, pandemic plans have not been revised. The uh, lockdowns are still part of them. They're still uh, on the table. So I've got Brownstone Institute runs the only alternative pandemic planning study group in the world, and we're cooperating in that respect with Leeds University. I also have a censorship working group that's trying to unearth all the ways in which big tech is cooperating with uh, with administrative agencies and third parties to uh, to really manipulate the public mind in, in creepy ways that have never been part of my life before. So this is all kind of new. 
And then we've got a final um, working group that's that's really studying this issue of uh, central bank digital currencies and, and where they're headed. So that's the kind of work that uh, Brownstone does in addition to supporting 10, 15 fellows at any one time. So we're, we're pretty darn busy. So if, if, if uh, your viewers want to subscribe, you can just do that for free. I, you know, we send one email a week, a uh, little bit of chit chat, and then links to all of the articles for the previous week. And I always appreciate the support. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you for coming on. Uh, it's been fun, and I hope to do it again soon. Thank you, Peter, for your wonderful work. Thanks for tuning in. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss an episode and go to petersanons.com for daily videos and in-depth articles with charts and all the gory details. Okay, we'll be watching. See you next time.